Well, um, we are uh, in week five of our series called The Story, and if you're just kind of journey, journeying and joining us this morning, um, this is a series that we've kind of been walking through for the past two years, and uh, it's the story of the Bible. And so we've uh, kind of taken some breaks here and there, but overall we've been journeying through this for two years, and we've just now kind of gotten to the life of Jesus uh, over the last couple months, and um, we're excited to be jumping back in this morning and talking about some of the signs and the miracles that he did. Um, but I'm excited to be with you. Um, we had just gotten back from vacation. Last Sunday we were gone. Um, Caitlin and I, we went on a little mini vacation on a cruise uh, last weekend and so we missed being here and we're so thankful we're back with you guys now. Um, I still wish I was on the cruise, no offense to you guys, but it was a nice little break, a nice little getaway. And the great thing if you've ever cruised before is uh, it's not like the destination you go to, like that's fine, you know, it's not the, the room that you're staying in for sure. It's definitely not the bathroom in your room that you're staying in. But the great thing about a cruise is the food, right? If you've ever been to a cruise, you know the food is what you go for because it's pretty much nonstop food all the time. And so you have the dining room where you can eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but then they've got the buffet up on the top and you can eat pretty much 24 seven. And so this cruise ship had, you know, a Mongolian walk place. It had, you know, a carving station. It had the deli. It had a barbecue place. It had a hamburger place. You could get hamburgers anytime you wanted. It had like a Moe's restaurant in there. And so you could go to the Moe's. It had everything you could possibly want of want, including a 24-hour pizza place and 24 hours ice cream, which you can't get better than 24-hour uh, ice cream, right? And so we would literally go to the dining room, we would eat dinner, and of course when you go and you eat dinner at a cruise ship, you don't just order like one appetizer and one entree, right? Because you can order as many as you want. And so, you know, we would order multiple appetizers, multiple entrees, we'd have dessert at dinner, and uh, we would be stuffed, like you couldn't really even walk, you were so full. And then we would have somebody, we'd walk out into the hallway right outside the dining room and somebody would go, let's go get some ice cream. And I'm like miserable, you know, like I don't want to eat anything else. I don't think I can fit anything else into my mouth. And we would go up to the very top level. And what would I do? I would, of course, get some ice cream and then go back later that night and get some more ice cream because I wanted to surrender myself to the idea of having more and more food, right? I wanted to surrender my waistline and surrender my comfort even for that moment to eat more and more stuff. And when you start talking about the word surrender, a lot of times it has a negative connotation, but when we talk about surrender in that regard, surrender is really one of the easiest things that we can do. If you're on a diet and you are doing really well, you have a healthy breakfast, healthy lunch, healthy dinner, have some nuts, have some snacks, like you've done really good for the day, you put the kids down to bed, and then you're walking through the kitchen, and then there's Girl Scout cookies, right? It's Girl Scout cookie season, and so there's just a box of Girl Scout cookies that is sitting on the counter, and you think to yourself, I've done pretty good today, right? I'm going to reward myself with just a bite of a cookie. And so you take one bite of the cookie and then you look at it and go, well, these cookies are really small. Like I can't just put half of a Girl Scout cookie back in the box. So I'll just finish this cookie. And then you think, well, if I finish one, I really should just two. They're just bite size. Like they're pretty good. And after a while you go, I've eaten half the box of Girl Scout cookies. I don't know if this uh, happened to anyone else, but it's happened to me. Tagalong, Samoas, those are where it's at. And you surrender yourself, right? You had a great desire. You had a great goal. You wanted to lose weight. You were on this diet, but you surrendered to your fleshly desires and gave in to that desire and ate the cookies Then you didn't want to. Same thing when you wake up. If you wanted to get up early and go to the gym and it's raining outside and it's cold and you don't really want to get out of the nice warm bed, you want to sleep a little bit longer. It's easy to surrender to the temporary fulfillment of staying in your bed rather than getting up and doing the hard and difficult things. It's super easy for ourselves, especially when it comes to our flesh, it's super easy for us to surrender to our fleshly desires. But now where it gets really, really difficult is when we wanna do hard things. And when we set New Year's resolutions, when we set goals for our lives, when there's things that we want to accomplish and they're not easy, and they go against everything that's within us. They go against the, the, the easy things and the comfortable things that we want to do in our lives. That's when surrender becomes very difficult because we are no longer giving into our flesh, but we're trying to do something radically different. 
Same thing goes with our spiritual life. When it comes to our spiritual life, it's an attitude of surrender. That's really what the Christian life is all about. It's about surrender, but it's not something that we easily do because surrender ultimately in the Christian life means that we're giving over control of our life. Where we're saying ultimately, okay, here's the keys to my life. You're now in control. You're calling the shots. I'm not in control of my life. You're the Lord. You're the Savior. You're the one that is leading me in the steps that I need to take. And so we're surrendering our lives to Jesus. Now, that's a really difficult and hard thing to do a lot of times because there's everything within us, everything in our flesh, everything in our own spirit that pushes against that, where we don't want to go down that road because we're going to lose control. But here's the truth that we're gonna see this morning and hopefully that we can walk away with is this idea that from surrender comes blessing. Or you could say it this way, that blessing comes through surrender. That every time that we come to a place where we're willing to surrender our lives and give God control of our lives, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even when it goes against everything that we feel deep inside of our bones, when we give surrender and we surrender our lives over to Jesus, blessing always comes as a result. Blessing comes through surrender. And we're going to see that this morning in a story that most of us have probably heard at one point or another. It's found in Matthew chapter 14. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. You can also get our Church at the Grove app and uh, you can follow along on there. That's a great way to get connected in what's going on in the life of the church, but also kind of follow along and take some sermon notes on there. But Matthew chapter 14, and it's the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And you probably have heard this story before if you've grown up in church or even if you haven't. Um, It's a popular story. It's in all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're gonna look at this account found in the book of Matthew this morning, Matthew chapter 14. And it starts in verse 13 and it says this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. So before we can continue, we gotta go, what happened? So when Jesus heard that this had happened, he went to a solitary place. So what had happened? He had just found out that John the Baptist, who was his cousin, his friend, his partner in ministry, the one that had baptized him in the Jordan River, that John the Baptist had not just been arrested, but because of his preaching and what he was proclaiming, he was beheaded. So he had just heard out that his friend, his cousin, his companion in ministry had just been beheaded. And so what did Jesus want to do? Jesus wanted to withdraw from the crowds. He wanted to find a solitary place where he could spend some alone, uninterrupted time with his father. Now, we've all been there a time or two, right? If you've ever lost a loved one, you probably have gone through this. Yes, you need people around you to help you and to support you and to love on you and to pray for you. But you also need just some time to kind of pull back and just kind of reflect and to process and just spend some alone time. If you've ever had even a hard day at work and you're just mentally or physically exhausted from all that has gone on, you wanna come home maybe and you just wanna unwind. This is so me, I'm, I'm an introvert by nature and so I get energized by being away from people. Like I love Sunday morning, I love all of you guys, but I also want to go home after church and I want to be around no one. Like that's me, um, I have a hard day at work and I want to come home, I want to close my door, I want to turn off the lights and I just want to veg out and walk watch something on the TV and not think about anything because that's just how I'm wired, right? Some of you love to be around people. For me, I don't enjoy being around people. So um, I do. I do like being around people, just not some people. Um, no, I'm just joking. Uh, but you, you, you need energized, right? He needed to be re-energized. He had been doing ministry. He had just found out this terrible news and he wanted to withdraw from a, to a solitary place. And this is what he was trying to do. He was trying to break away, to go out in the boat, to go across the way and get away from the crowds of people that were following him. And listen to what happens in verse um, 13 and 14. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. So Jesus tries to break away. He tries to go and seclude himself from all the people that are following him. He's had a tough day. He's got some emotional news. He's been healing people. He's been doing miracles. He's been teaching. He's just physically, mentally, emotionally exhausted. He wants nothing more than just to retreat and spend some time by himself. But what happens as soon as the boat docks, there's a crowd of people that are just there waiting on him. 
And Jesus in this moment um, shows that he's not surrendered to his physical will, but he's, he's surrendered to God, his heavenly Father's will, because he doesn't do what I would have done. I would have done, hey guys, we're closed, you know, go home, see you next week, we'll be here Sunday, but right now we're closed, everybody go home, go do your own thing, we're not open right now. But Jesus doesn't do that. He looks at the crowd and it says that he has compassion on them that he sees them. And, and the word compassion there is actually a word that means that it's like a physically moving from his bowels. Like it's a physical reaction that he has when he sees the people coming out to meet him. And he sees them as these lost people that are in need of a shepherd to help lead them and guide them. And he's there to heal them, it says. He heals their sick. And then he says in another one of the gospels that he begins to teach the crowds that are there. And he begins to minister to these people even though he's physically and mentally uh, exhausted. He doesn't have time for the me time. He doesn't have time to just go back and do his own thing, but instead he has to engage the people because he was more concerned with the father's will than his fleshly will. He was more concerned with what God wanted him to do rather than what he felt like he needed to do. And that's so true for our lives as well, that surrender isn't about doing what is easiest, but it's doing what is right. Surrender isn't about doing what's easiest, but it's doing, about, doing what is right. And for most of us, when it comes to surrender, it's super easy for us to surrender to do the easy things, but it's not about doing the hard and the difficult things and the right things in life. It would have been wrong for Jesus to send the crowds away, but he instead engages them, he begins to minister to them, he heals them, he teaches them, he does this ministry towards the people. And then I love what happens right after Jesus is teaching all day, they're tired, they're exhausted, and then the disciples kind of realize, oh wow, the sun's setting and we haven't eaten anything all day. Now, I don't know, biblical times are probably a lot different than our day today, but I mean, come on. I don't know about you guys, but there's not a whole lot of days where I get to the end of the day and the sun is setting and I'm like, huh, I haven't eaten anything today. Like that doesn't happen much for me because for me, food is not just for survival. Food is a hobby. And so um, I, I wanna make sure that I'm eating. We go on vacation and it's literally like we wake up in the morning, we have breakfast. And while we're eating breakfast, we're talking about what we're gonna eat for the, every other meal of the day, plus all the snacks that are in there as well, right? Because food is a hobby for me. And so for some reason, these disciples and the people that were out there in the crowds, they come to a place and they go, huh, we haven't eaten and we're really hungry. And so in this moment, the people are there. There's 5,000 of them. It actually says 5,000 men. And it's implied that there's women and children there as well. So we could say maybe 15,000 people are there and no one has eaten for the day. And the disciples begin to realize that this is a problem and that the people need to go away so that they can get food. And listen to how it plays out. Verse 15, as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. So the disciples have now come to the place where we're hungry, we're exhausted, we know Jesus is exhausted, and so let's send the crowds away so that we can get together, we'll find something to eat, and we'll finally get that little bit of R&R &R that we've been looking for. And so that's how Jesus' disciples come into play here. Now we see two very different reactions, because when Jesus saw the crowds, he began to minister to them. He had surrendered himself to the Father's will, but the disciples had come to a place where they saw the crowds and they knew what God was capable of. They had been walking with Jesus. I mean, they had seen Jesus turn water into wine. We talked about that last week. They had seen Jesus do miracle after miracle. He, they had seen him heal people from near and far. They had actually been sent out on a missionary journey where they had been ministering and they had seen miracles happen in their own lives through the power of God. And so they knew that God was capable of anything and everything, that Jesus, the God in the flesh was there with them and that he was capable of doing miracles. But yet when they see the crowd, their reaction is not, hey, let's go to Jesus and see what he recommends. It's not, hey, let's go consult Jesus and see if he knows some secret recipe we can whip up that will feed 15,000 people. That's not what they do. Instead, they go to Jesus and they say, listen, we don't have any food. The people are hungry. Jesus, tell them to go home and to go away. 
They were more concerned about their maybe personal comfort and they lacked the vision of who Jesus was that they were missing out on the blessing that God could ultimately give. And this is where we see that surrender is not just a one-time commitment or it's not just a one-time decision, but it's an ongoing commitment. Surrender is not something that we do just one time in our lives and then continue to live however we want, but it's an ongoing daily commitment. The disciples had experienced Jesus. They had experienced his goodness. They had experienced him. They had been part of the ministry that Jesus had done. They had surrendered their will to him at one point, but now the tides have changed. They're tired, they're hungry, and they want to just spend nothing else but just alone time, solitary. They just want to go by themselves, send the crowds away, and they are not surrendered to Jesus's will in this moment. And this is something for the church to hear because a lot of times this is what we teach. We teach that salvation and surrender is this one-time decision where you come to church, you pray a prayer, you check a box, you shake somebody's hand, you get baptized, and then you go on and you live your life however you wanna live your life. And there's people all around this community and really all around the Southeast and all around the little country. And they're all thinking and they're basing their salvation experience on something that they did at VBS when they were eight years old, which we're not saying that wasn't important, but that one act of surrender doesn't show that they are belonging and in the hands of Jesus. The only way for us to truly know that we have been saved, that we have been saved from our sins and that God is working and moving in our lives is if we have a constant attitude of surrender. That we say, hey, it's not just this one-time act where we pray a prayer, but it's an ongoing commitment to surrender. And the disciples had missed out on this somewhere and they had thought, hey, we've, we've, we've surrendered at one point or another in our lives, but they were missing it at this moment. And so it says this in verse 16. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away, talking about the crowds, you give them something to eat. I love Jesus. Like I love just how forceful he is and just is like, guys, stop being silly. Like just just give them something to eat. And they said, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. So again, they were limiting God in what he was capable of doing. They had seen the miracles. They knew what Jesus was capable of doing. But yet, when we aren't fully surrendering our lives to Jesus, it limits our perspective on what God is capable of doing. Because in this moment, they were more ready to see what they physically could do rather than what God was capable of doing. They were capable of the possible. Jesus was capable of the impossible. Jesus could take the five loaves of bread and the two fish and turn it into a feast for the multitudes where the disciples could take the fish and the loaves and they could have it be enough food for them and their friends. And so Jesus has turned the tables here. He says, you go give them something to eat. Fully surrendered people trust God to make the impossible possible. It's when we see big things. We trust God for big things that are outside of the realm of possibility because he's capable of it. Verse 18, it says, bring those fishes and loaves to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So what happens? Jesus breaks the bread, he passes it out, the fish is broken, they're passing it out and not only is there enough to feed the multitudes but there's 12 baskets left over. There's 12 baskets left over, which just so happens to be the number of disciples that are following Jesus. And so in this moment, we see Jesus do an incredible miracle feeding the 5,000, but we see this idea of surrender. Surrendering to Jesus doesn't limit our lives like a lot of times we think. We think a lot of times that when we surrender to Jesus, that it's gonna be like this constant killjoy, right? Right? that it's gonna be, man, if I surrender my life to Jesus, I'm never gonna be able to have any fun. 
I'm never gonna get the blessings. I'm never gonna get to experience life and how the world sees I need to experience life. Man, if I surrender to Jesus and I'm a teenager, man, that means I'm gonna have to do things different than my friends. And I'm gonna look different. I'm gonna act different. And kids might talk about me and I don't really wanna do that. You know, if you're a college student or a single and you say, hey, I wanna surrender my life to Jesus. And he says, okay, then you need to live a life of purity until you get married, save sex until marriage. And the world says, you're missing out. You're you're totally missing the boat. How do you know that if you're gonna like something, if you don't try it first, like you've gotta get it out there. And then you're going, well, wait, Jesus is telling me I need to surrender to him. And man, it seems like he's letting me miss out on what life is really all about. And I'm missing out on this pleasure and the satisfaction that the world tells me that I desperately need. And it says that constantly, this is the idea that the world tries to paint, that if you surrender to Jesus, then you're going to miss out on something here in life but it's actually the exact opposite. When we fully surrender to Jesus, we experience blessing. We experience the impossible. The things that we never thought that we would ever see in our lives begin to come true and happen because fully surrendered people experience the blessings of God in their lives. And so what does it look like? How do we surrender to God? The first thing we do is we start with what we have. The disciples, in order to see the miracle, in order to fully surrender to Jesus, they have to start with what they have. Well, in this story, they had five loaves of bread and two fish. So you had to start with what they have. What do you have? I mean, take inventory of your life. You have maybe some possessions. You maybe have a house. You maybe have a car. You also have gifts, right? You have talents. You have abilities, Some of you have incredible wisdom and knowledge. Some of you have book smarts. Some of you have common sense. Typically not both of those, but we have book smarts or we have common sense. We've got people that have all these incredible gifts and all these abilities and all these talents. And we have to first take inventory of what we have. And the second thing we do is that we give them to Jesus. We give what we have to Jesus. We put them in his hands. And what we can do in our own ability is minuscule compared to what Jesus can do when we put things into his hands. They could only feed 12 people perhaps, but when they put it in Jesus' hands, 15,000 people are fed. And so when we surrender, it's we take inventory of what we have, we give it to Jesus as much or as little as maybe we have, but we give it to him, he blesses it, and then we obey his commands. What does he tell the disciples to do? He says, go, right? He says, go and pass out the food and take up the food. He gives them orders and gives them commands. And as they follow his commands, not only do they receive a blessing, but the world around them gets the blessing as well, right? Because the multitudes are fed. So we start with what we have, we give it to Jesus, and then we obey his commands. Jesus says all throughout the Bible that if we love him, if we're going to be surrendered to him, then we obey his commands. We obey what the word of God teaches. It's not based on what we feel like is right, but we base our lives and we base the truth of our lives on what scripture tells us to do. And so fully surrendered people obey his commands. And when we do that, blessing comes in our lives. And so where are you at this morning? Have you experienced the blessings of God in your life because you're fully surrendered to him? Have you surrendered yourself initially to him in this idea of salvation? Salvation is when we finally come to the point of realization that Jesus is God in the flesh, has come down from heaven. He's lived a perfect life here on earth. And even in the midst of our sin, he has saved us and rescued us by taking on our punishment that we deserved on the cross. And it says those who call on his name will be saved, that we can have a right relationship with God, that we can be given a new identity. We will be seen as righteous children of the son of God. Like, I mean, this is incredible truth. Have you experienced that? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus for the very first time? We had a student, and we'll show the testimony here shortly, but we had a student at Disciple Now who we actually baptized two weeks ago, and he came to that place at Disciple Now. He realized he had been around church some, he had been in CLC some, and he had realized at Disciple Now that he needed to surrender his life to Jesus. 
and, and we baptized him that morning. It was an incredible thing. Have you come to the same point where you've, you've experienced that type of surrender, surrendering your life for the first time to Jesus? Have you surrendered your finances to Jesus? I, I, I don't wanna harp on this, but this is oftentimes the whole, the grip that uh, the world gets on us is this love of money where we want more and more and more. Or are you someone that said, God, everything I have is yours. You tell me how to spend it and I'll spend it. If you want me to give it, I'll give it. God, let me know what I need to do and I'll do it. We, we have the 90 day tithe challenge. If that's something that you need to surrender over to the Lord, that's a great step for you to move in that direction. Maybe it's relationships where there's a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a friendship circle that you're a part of and they're not good for you and they're leading you in the wrong direction and you continue to invest and you continue to be in that group and God knows, hey, you need to move yourself out of that. You need to remove yourself from the situation. You can still be friends, but be friends at a distance because they're leading you in a direction you don't need to go. Have you fully surrendered your relationships, your parenting, your marriage? Maybe your husband and wife are struggling or maybe you're having incredible times together and life is great, but have you fully surrendered your marriage? your work life, your hobbies? Have you surrendered your time, your schedule? Have you uh, given your purpose and your mission in life? Have you surrendered that to the hands of Jesus? Because when we come to a place where we surrender our lives to him, we experience blessing. So have you surrendered? Are there areas where you're still holding back this morning? And is there something that you need to give over to him? We're gonna celebrate here in a second the biggest uh, surrender really that there ever was. And that was Jesus, as I've already kind of shared the gospel a little bit, but it's this message that Jesus died on a cross for your sins and for mine. And he tells us to remember this uh, ceremony of the Lord's Supper. And the ceremony of the Lord's Supper is where we come to the table and we take the bread that had been broken and the wine or the juice that had been a representation of the blood that he spilt for us. And it's his body and his blood. And we take that in remembrance of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And so in a second, we're gonna have the band come back up and we're gonna sing and we're gonna have you guys come and take in the Lord's Supper as a remembrance of what Jesus did on our behalf and how he fully surrendered himself to the Father's will. And as a result, as we take in communion this morning, I want us to take it with the attitude that we want to fully surrender our lives to him. We remember what he has done. And as a result, we want to give him everything that we have. And as a result of that, one of the re ways that we surrender to Jesus is we take on the mission that God has given us. We, we become his representatives here on earth. Just as Jesus left heaven to come down to earth to rescue people from their sins, we now as children of the God have the same responsibility. We're not dying on a cross for anybody, but we are people that now are ambassadors for Christ and we are to spread the news and the message of Jesus to the people around us. And, and so we wanna be fully surrendered to the mission that God has given us. And so when you came in, there were a couple of cards in your seat with a pen and uh, the cards look the exact same, but they are actually not the exact same. Um, and so you see on one card on the back, it says, write three names that you are committing to invite to church on Easter Sunday. Place this card at a location where you see it every day as a reminder to that commitment. And the other card says that you're committing to invite to church on Easter Easter, at the, end of one of the, at the end of the service, we will have a time where you can hang these cards on the front walls and we're gonna pray over them in a second. And so I want you to take these cards and when the band starts to play in just a second, I want you to start to pray for people in your life that don't have a connection to Jesus. They haven't experienced the blessing that God has given because they haven't fully surrendered to him. And so I want you to write down three names. And this is ideally everybody, not just families, but this is every individual in the family of people that you're gonna be praying for over the next several weeks leading up to Easter. 
Easter is April 21st, and it's always the biggest day of the church because it's when we're singing and celebrating what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. And so we want you to write the three names and the one that says to hang it up on the front wall. When you come up to take communion this morning, we want you to bring this card up with you. And as you take in the body and the blood of Jesus, we want you just to step to the side. We've got little hangers on the walls over here and you can hang these cards up as a visual reminder that you're gonna be praying for these individuals leading up to Easter. And we're gonna have people and teams coming here um, throughout the weeks leading up to Easter. And we're gonna be praying over these names and praying over these cards because we wanna see God uh, give blessing and, and let people truly understand the miracle of surrender. And so we're not just praying that people show up on Easter, but we're praying that people will come to know Jesus on Easter because that really is the greatest thing that you can ever experience. When we fully surrender to Jesus, it's not a killjoy, but it's a blessing that comes into our lives. So let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you so much, Lord, that you're a God that fully surrendered himself and was willing to die on a cross, not because you had done anything wrong, but because I had done everything wrong. And the people in this room, because we were sinful individuals, Lord, you came to rescue us from our sins and to give us new life and to give us the blessing that only could come from you. And so, Lord, because of the sacrifice that you have made, Lord, we say this morning that we want to fully surrender to you. It's our only right response, Lord, is that when we experience and see the grace of our God, Lord, that we want to give you everything that we have. And so, Lord, I pray that right now you would speak over the people in this room, people that are watching online, Lord, and that you would just let them kind of just in this moment know what are the areas of their life where they're failing to surrender to you and that they would be willing to have the courage and the commitment to say, God, I wanna give you this area. Help me to do the hard things. Help me to give you my finances or my marriage or my relationships or my kids or parenting or whatever it might be. Lord, I wanna give you, I wanna surrender my life to you. And Lord, we pray as a part of that surrender, Lord, that we would surrender our wills to you and that we would be willing to live on mission for you. Lord, you have not saved us just to keep us, but you've saved us to send us out, to be your representatives here in this community. And Lord, we know that Easter is a huge time in the life of the church, and we wanna see people come to know you in a real and powerful way. We wanna see men and women and children and teenagers, we wanna see them surrender their lives to you this Easter so that they can experience the blessing that comes through surrender. And so, Lord, as we write down names on our cards and we begin to pray and we begin to maybe even fast over the people that we're praying for, Lord, I pray that you would move and that you would work in our lives and in the lives of the people we're ministering to so that they could experience the blessing that only comes from following you. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you again for your word, for your truth. We thank you that we can come to the table of uh, the Lord's Supper this morning and that we can take in your body and your blood knowing that you shed that on the cross for us. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you again for this morning for your truth. In your name we pray, amen. So as you feel led, if you wanna come and just grab a piece of the bread and dip it into the juice, please don't pick up the juice cup. Um, that's nasty. Um, so don't do that. Um, but just pick that up, dip it in there, and then you can pray over your cards and hook them up there. That'd be great. Thanks.